Thank you. Um, I must apologise to the people who may already have heard this at uh, the CIFA Archives Conference. Uh, please feel free to applaud at the end again, everything you did last time. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be looking at collaborative approaches to implementing potential disposal strategies for museums. Um, and I work for Cotswold Archaeology, which I'm sure you all know is a commercial unit based in Gloucestershire, but we also have several other offices around the country. Um, I spent eight, seven or eight years in the field, um, and I work in post X, so I deal with the incoming fines and the outgoing fines, so I deal with museums and um, bother them into uh, letting us deposit our boxes. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I sit on the CIFA Archives Committee. I haven't done for long, um, but I've been to many sort of meetings. Uh, to do with archives and one of the main sort of themes that comes up quite often not not always i'd say um is space in museum or, or lack of it and um this these projects i'm going to talk about the three projects sort of looks at that and um they were they were put together to offer advice to museums and help maximize and new space in the stores more effectively so the first one we kicked off well with was the Gloucester Excavation Archive Enhancement Project, which ran between the dates there. Um, as with most councils, uh, Gloucester City Council maintained an archaeological excavation unit in various forms from the 70s into 2004. Um, and again, like most local government field units, Gloucester's developed a sizable post-X backlog. Most of these archives were produced in a pre-PPG-16 period where funding was often not available for post-X or full post-X assessment, write-up or deposition. In 1998, the then city archaeologist published a list of 17 sites which he considered to be priorities for publication. Um, this project focused on 14 of those. Up until this point, none of this material had been organised, um, officially deposited or made publicly available. Uh, the project was funded by English Heritage as it was then, um, and they specified that this should be a community engagement scheme using volunteers. And uh, the project dealt with key archaeological investigations in the city between 1983 and 1991. So the objectives were, as you can see, to sort and repackage the um, documentary archive, to sort and repackage the vault finds, uh, all to modern standards, and deposit these archives at the Gloucester City Museum and Art Gallery, which has since become the Museum of Gloucester. So, uh, the original archiving wasn't great. Um, this is probably, on the grand scheme, it's actually probably one of the better boxes. <laughs> um, they were, lots of finds were just in these strange brown bags, which were huge. And then right at the bottom, they had a tiny piece of pot. Um, lots and lots of boxes of those. Some finds just didn't bother with bags at all, you know, very eco-friendly, but not archive-friendly. Um, and <laughs> some were packed into these uh, canned peach boxes. There were hundreds of these boxes, which um, I can only presume the then curator ate a lot of uh, <laughs> clean peaches in heavy syrup. Um, some uh, finds were uh, just packed into these um, wooden crates as well. Um, originally designed to hold Grimsby fish. The boxes at the back um, are an example of uh, work we did in the, in the next phase, which we'll come back to, but uh, you can hopefully see they're a little bit clearer um, and, and state actually what's in the boxes. Uh, uh, yeah, the original um, labelling of the uh, archive also hindered matters, uh, sorry, and also hindered matters and as with some museum, nobody was really sure what was held in which boxes and where the boxes actually were. Um, this was one of the <laughs> main storerooms in Gloucester Museum. It's, it's where that's, you know, that's how I do it. Um, there are five in total spread uh, between the basement of this 1960s indoor market. Uh, there's one beneath the City Museum, but there's another one in the car park for the market, um, and there's one in the actual museum itself. The then curator wasn't really sure where any of these rooms were either, so he, it was a bit of an impossible task to find these boxes. Um, 
blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sorry. And uh, yeah, and the, again, the boxes were not clearly labelled or seemed to run it in the order. So this is where we um, did some of our work in the old archives building in Gloucester, which you'll be glad to hear has now been demolished. Um, and here's some examples of what we had to deal with. So none of these boxes had the site name on them. All we had was the old fashioned accession number and um, lots of tipex, um, and lots of scribbling out, uh, lots of lots of confusion. Um, the documentary the documentary archives were much the same and were stored in this very small room. Um, that was only accessible by this tiny ladder <laughs> um, and matters weren't helped by the fact you couldn't stand upright in this room at all. Um, going up the ladder was fine, coming down wasn't so great, especially as you can see all the bins, the other boxes around, um, yeah, it wasn't so great. So that's a photograph from inside, these are, this is the end result, so these are the boxes that we returned to Gloucester, but um, yeah, I didn't actually have enough room to get back to take a picture, so um, you can see the space was limited. Uh, yeah, the majority of the finds boxes were stored beneath the City Museum, however, and over six months I moved over 600 boxes from this room um, along this long corridor and up these stairs. Um, I became very fit and my emotions ranged between fairly irritated and rage at um, <laughs> poor archiving techniques, uh, we must say. And although the volunteers were great, they were all of a certain age, so I, I, I didn't feel I could utilise them in helping me lug these boxes up and down the stairs, so um, it was a task for myself. I did lose a stone in weight though, which is one benefit of it. Um, due to space, we could only transport 30, 40 boxes to, at a time to the archives. And so we had to hunt down and organise the boxes um, well in advance. I wasn't very popular with the volunteers because the first project I accidentally chose was the largest one. Um, but I flipped them donuts and we, we, we got on with it in the end. And um, here we go, here's Sue and Simeon uh, ready to, to spring into action. You can see Sue's face there. That's, that's the face she made when I came out with all the boxes. Um, so yeah, we replaced all the plastic bags, sorry, the paper bags with plastic bags. Uh, Finds were washed and marked and boxes were consolidated. There's John. Um, the accession number was stamped on documentary archives. Metal staples were banished. Um, photos were labelled and put into plastic wallets. Uh, the archives quantified and uh, metal ring binders were replaced with acid-free boxes, rightly so. Um, a discard strategy was implemented because the amount of bulk finds, we just couldn't repackage everything. It was too much. And that was one of the things we needed to do was they had simply collected everything on site um, when they did the original excavation. So we needed to think about what can we, what can we do with this? What can we keep? Do we need to keep our stratified animal bone? Not really. Not telling us anything other than there were some sheep in the middle of Gloucester in the Roman period. It, it didn't add anything to the archaeological record. So we were greatly helped by this gentleman. Oh, no, that's not a gentleman. That's another volunteer. Sorry. This gentleman is uh, Dr. Peter Worry. He's uh, studying in pickle snake now. Who is a CBM expert, and he um, was invaluable to us in going through all the boxes of CBM and judging what he deemed was worth keeping and what was worth um, discarding. So at the end of the six months, we were very pleasantly surprised to discover that. We had reduced 651 boxes to 252. We discarded 400 kilograms of material and um, that equated to a 60% reduction in box numbers. Um, the, disc the discard strategy on the CBOM alone sorry, accounted for a reduction of 112 boxes of 363 kilograms of material. Um, so you can understand why he was such a help because you know, that, that's a huge chunk of, of what we managed to discard. Um, the graph here, it only shows 10 of the 14 sites we worked on simply because four of the sites we just simply couldn't find the finds. They've gone missing. The curator didn't know where they were. Um, 
so yeah, that, that wasn't great. But you can see this was the largest site, the site that Gabby, that's when we started on. Um, we knocked it down from just over 350 to about 90 boxes. So a, I think that's a huge, um, a huge difference in, in space. Okay, so this 60% reduction of boxes made a huge difference to the museum stores, obviously, and liberated valuable space. More importantly, it made the archive safer and more stable, and it also made it finally accessible to the public. Um, a report was written detailing the original condition of the archive, the work undertaken to make it archivally sound, any material identified as missing, and an assessment of the work needed to produce a final report. Um, so to discard 400 kilograms of material from just 14 sites gives you an idea of what might be done at the museum um, if we could work work there more. Unfortunately, I don't know if many know the curatorial situation that Gloucester has changed um, last year, so they no longer have an archaeological curator, they have no curator at all. So this work, um, we had hoped it would be the start of a, a process of going through and, and helping them out and writing projects up, but I don't know what's going to happen and I think it's probably just stalled, unfortunately, so we'll, we'll wait and hear what, what goes on from there. Um, so, yes, here are some of the final boxes. Um, another benefit of the work is that sites previously not reported on have been given a new lease of life. Um, CA, uh, Gloucester Archaeology, are currently working on the, Great, the Gloucester Greater Blackfriars project, which is focusing on two of these sites. Um, we're aiming to publish it in 2020, and it's, um, it's quite an important piece of work because it looks at um, some timber revetments associated with an early Roman war in the city. So it's, it's quite good for people in Gloucester. Um, so yes, so before I move on to the next project, I'm going to have a photographic interlude, uh, because one of the main things for, that was thrown up from this work was that we looked at a lot of CBM and animal bone projects and stuff, but a lot of the volunteers hadn't really worked with documentary archives before. They had come into, they come into our offices, they wash finds, they mark finds, they put them in boxes or whatever. They don't do um, uh, you know, look at photographs and accessioning and stuff. And what we were able to do was look at some of the photographs that come from these sites, which included some archaeologists, uh, which is great. I love archaeology, but I like field archaeologists more um, and other archaeologists. I'm fond of other archaeologists. And, um, <laughs> uh, so I think it threw up an interesting um, perspective of the history of archaeology as well. And it threw up a lot of conversations we had just in our in our tea room about the people, you know, they'd been digging in the 70s and the 80s, I haven't been going that long, but it's just about different methods used, um, planning techniques, the tools we use and stuff like that. So, anyway, so we unearthed some of these beauties. Uh, so we got these guys, their donkey jackets. Mm -hmm. I like the hair uh, on the chap on the uh, oh, left, if I'm right, sorry. Um, so these guys, this guy's hair, again, is a bit of a winner. These two, they're, <laughs> they're great. Um, <laughs> um, this shot is just um, everything I wish site would be these days. And um, although a little bit blurry, this is my uh, favourite. I've been on site recently and I did try to pull this off, but the, uh, the berry let me down somewhere, unfortunately. Um, so now, so I'll leave that up for a few moments. Um, the, uh, the previous project was deemed so successful. Uh, that it led to the Gloucester Museum Store CBM project the following year. Uh, and this project was, again, well, it wasn't, he didn't instigate that, but this one was instigated by Peter Worry, our CBM expert. Um, and he wanted to find CBM stamps from Gloucester, from the city of Gloucester and Gloucestershire that had once been identified but since gone missing, which seems to be a common theme with Gloucester Museums being gone missing. Um, so here he is again. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, 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 does, he does study things intently, does Peter? Um, uh, and this was funded by um, Gloucester City Council. Uh, so, yeah, and as with the previous project, this aimed to find and record the CBM from three significant sites in the Gloucester area. Uh, this time, myself and volunteers, many of whom volunteered in the previous project worked in a small room in the basement of Gloucester's indoor market. Um, and unlike last time, there's no heating or natural light. You may, in, 
There's the increase in hats. So this is giving uh, <laughs> an idea of the ambiance of our location. It smelled very strongly of curry powder as well, and damp. It's not, not, not hugely nice. And this is in February as well, so it wasn't, wasn't hugely warm. There we go, in a strange cage. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and as before, uh, the location of most of the boxes was unknown, which required another search of the museum stores, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> and once they've been located, finally, uh, unorganised CBM assemblages dating back to the 80s were ordered, collated, repackaged, and brought in line with modern curation standards. Um, this also allowed for this data, so box location, box number, etc., um, to be added, added to the museum's database for the first time. The drawing and documentation of previously unrecorded CBM stamps was also undertaken. This wasn't something that was put in the um, brief, but we were ahead of schedule and Peter, uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to, to whilst they were out, um, this is a lady called Valentina who was a brilliant illustrator, um, came in as a, as a volunteer, so we thought it would be foolish to, to, to miss this opportunity, so that's what we did. Okay, she's good. So uh, the work enabled unreported Roman tiles within these boxes to be catalogued and recorded for the first time, as I said. Um, yeah, one box of stamp tile had been missing for several years, having been searched for unsuccessfully for many people previously. And I mean, like 15 or so years have been missing. Um, the last person to see the box was Tim Darville uh, <laughs> in the 80s. Uh, and um, that's no casting, that's not casting any aspersions, but he was the last culprit, um, yeah. and uh, this box it contained around 100 stamped examples, which was roughly a quarter of the entire corpus of Gloucester's civic stamp tiles. So, for Peter, a CBM enthusiast, it was quite a big thing to be missing. He, you know, it's like he was missing missing a, a, an arm or something. He, he wasn't pleased. So, um, there he is. And, uh, <laughs> So when we, we, we finally find it, we find it, which was great. And Peter was so excited, he kissed the box. Um, and yeah, typical of some museums, somebody had put it on the shelf and they had negated to cross out the name of an old site and the contents of the box. They just reused the box and had put it back in with what actually was in the box facing the wall. Um, and it'd been like that for 15 or so years. So, um, so a little bit of investigative work, found it and Peter was happy. <coughs> Um, so yeah, so at the end of our time in the basement, over 45 kilograms of material was recommended for discard. Um, the outcome of the project is not only clearer and more secure packaging, um, as seen in, in the earlier photograph I showed you, but also the recording of previously undiscovered items. By using the data gained, Peter has written a recent article for Britannia titled Production, Distribution, Use and Curation, a Study of Stamp, Tile, from Gloucestershire, and I've read it, and it is very good. Um, so, Peter's not, yes, he is in the next one. So, <laughs> so following the success, if I do say so myself, the, of these two schemes, a further project was undertaken in February. Oh no, sorry, that's one of the stamps he, we found. Uh, February last year. Uh, so this was the Stride Museum Scoping Project, which leads, links in with um, what was published yesterday because uh, the museum, the museum in the park, was one of five museums to receive funding from Historic England in partnership with the SMA to participate in scoping studies to assess the methods and likely outcomes for retrospective collections. Rationalisation. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Gail, but I think it was just one of five... five. I've just said that, I? One of five museums um, who looked at what their archaeological... Um, archives contained and what would need to be done to bring it up to tip-top condition. And that information has led to this, so, which is good. Um, so this was slightly different in that we weren't unpacking boxes and repackaging them, but we were just scoping. Um, so, so I won't read them out. Um, well, I'll briefly read them out. <laughs> the project aims were to assess what was held in the boxes, so we just opened them and photographed them, uh, devise a discard criteria. I was, um, I worked with Alexia Clark, who is the curator at Stroud. She has no archaeological background, so it was a little bit daunting to be the only person with any archaeological background, um, so I was put on the spot somewhat, but um, it was 
good to be able to offer advice on <coughs> this is worth keep. I think this is worth keeping. But I think I have to ask other people. Blah 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 blah. Um, and at the end of this, we had to produce a report summarising the above, um, along with strengthening the exercise uh, recommendations for the compilation, compilation of national guidelines. Um, so we opened the photograph, the contents of around two thousand boxes. We also searched through the contents and assessed their condition. This is a blurry photograph of um, Stroud's stores. It's not massive. It's not the worst stores I've ever been into. Com in comparison to Gloucester, it was like Harrods up there. It was, it was, it was pretty good. Um, so the archives were a, a mixture of developer-funded um, university volunteer and antiquarian sites, such as Worsley Roman Villa. Again, all were pre ppg 16 and again, there were some fine examples of packaging including these uh, cigarette boxes with um, tiny, tiny writing on there, trying to work out what was in each one. There were um, lots of ice cream tubs, and uh, these strange wooden boxes were just a random assortment of stuff in. Nothing was marked. We didn't know what any of the contents of this stuff was. So we, this is when we had to say, well, what's the value in keeping the contents of these boxes? There might be nice things in there, but what do we do with it? We can't attribute it to anything. So um, it's sort of one of, one of the things to consider. Um, and this glass uh, sort of display thing from a, 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 I think it was Sunny Cigars in the shop. Um, there were around 6,000 bags of finds in the boxes. And there were also 180 archive boxes, folders, and drawing rods. And I, I went through those and just assessed whether um, they needed bringing up to modern day standards. And unfortunately, 90% of them did. Um, so, another photograph of the store. Uh, the information we accrued helped the museum move forward and begin a rationalisation process involving the assessment of their flint collections. This should then allow them to decide on retention or display dependent on various factors. So my colleague went to the stores, went through the boxes, um, and she could now identify where the flints were, which was one benefit of our previous work. And this is some of the photographs she took of the nice flints um, that she found. So there were roughly 1,800 flint items, and many were stored in just those paper envelopes. But unfortunately, a lot of these, although they're very pretty, had no corresponding information on them. They were just random bits of flint in, in paper envelopes, unfortunately. Um, we couldn't have accomplished any of these things without the great help of the museums and the volunteers, and here's some photographs of them all. Well, not of them all, but a few. <laughs> um, and quite fairly, as I'm sure you would all agree, museum staff aren't known for having plenty of time in their hands to put up with me phoning up and saying, can I come and delve in your stores? And I appreciate I'm quite irritating. I send a lot of emails, I phone up a lot of people, uh, draining your, your precious time. Um, but Everyone I dealt with in museums was eternally uh, patient with me, and um, I, I, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have done it without, without their help. And, um, and obviously the volunteers, the volunteers were imperative in this. Um, we wouldn't, wouldn't have done, well, I couldn't have done it on my own, so it was completely on my own, and I couldn't have done it without anything. Uh, our work has benefit, benefited the museums, um, Historic England, or English Heritage as it was then, and members of the public. Uh, this has also in turn aided all commercial archaeology units by clearing valuable storage space. Um, all three of these projects were completed ahead of schedule and within budget, as I've just said, in no small part thanks to the commitment and hard work of the volunteers. As, many, as mentioned, many of our volunteers who started with the first project worked on the later ones also. So Sue, Sue is in the bottom uh, photo <coughs> there in New York. She's in Kemble today washing skeletons. So she continues to come in and, and volunteer with us. Um, and here's a, a snippet from Sue. So Sue came into archaeology later in life. Um, <coughs> she's lived in Gloucestershire her entire life, uh, but she's found the work in museums, um, I think, a really sort of satisfying and rewarding experience, <coughs> hopefully. I presume that's why she still comes along. Um, and this is what Alexia at Stroud had to say. I think um, 
Lexi was a little bit nervous when we started about what we might discover or recommend. Um, but in the end, it all seemed to work out quite well. She's happy. We have left on good terms. <laughs> she still answers the phone to me, which is good. Um, and finally, uh, Andrew Armstrong, who's a city, a Gloucester city archaeologist, who was the gentleman who um, put in process the entire first project he, he got funding from. from his uh, to conclude, although these were relatively small scale, but sound projects, the methodology with some adaption could be used for larger schemes in the future. One possibility could be offering advice to museums with no archaeological staff rather than solely relying on this. I must apologise, I've not read, yet read your uh, publication <laughs> yesterday. Uh, this is probably what it says in there. So, uh, um, these projects are vital for us as a unit, mainly as it engages us with volunteers, the community, and closely with museums, which is of utmost importance to us. Um, we know the finances are not there for this to be a museum's first choice of spending, but hopefully the end result and guidance given might be good as well. Thank you.